speaker will be uh, Roya. Uh, can she be Roya? Is from Iran, I think, and uh, she has an Arabic name. Ro Roya in Arabic uh, Roya. means uh, vision. Roya means vision. <laughs> <in> <laughs> <Arabic>. <laughs> <laughs> it's Roya. Roya means vision. It means vision. And the Arabic language. <laughs> Uh, Roya is a, a, a Roya Kashif is a senior researcher and head of the Human Rights Committee of Association of uh, a French word Associ Association de Charche Irénien, <laughs> or UK Asylum System, and the, uh, the apply to the Iranian Asylum uh, Seeker. If you want to introduce yourself more than that, and, uh, and then we can speak in two minutes. Okay, um, I'm Roya Pacheffi. I'm the head of the Human Rights Committee of my organization. My organization has been um, working for the last 20 years researching into major issues that concerns the future of Iran. Um, I'm here talking about Iran. I'm very aware of Iran is not part of the Arab world, but we have a lot of um, similar issues. Um, with what is happening politically in Iran today, with what is happening in the Arab world since the early spring, and also the plight of the unaccompanied minors in um, industrialized countries seeking asylum is similar regardless of whether they come from Iran or whether they come from any other country in the world. So um, although my personal experience is going to be talking about Iranian children claiming asylum within the UK system, the problems identified reflect a lot of what um, UNICEF and other organizations that have conducted research show to be the same for regardless of the uh, country of origin where these children are coming from. So I'm going to be talking specifically about Iran. I'm going to talk about um, uh, I conducted research in the year 2000 into the asylum system, and because of that, I interviewed policymakers, um, those who enforce policy, um, and I worked with solicitors first. Because of that, I formed a relationship with the Refugee Council, the Refugee Legal Centre in the UK, that provided advice for these children and various other solicitors. Um, since then, if they had issues, um, they uh, referred cases to me. Since year 2000, I've commented or have been consulted on over 550 cases. 10%, just over 10%, 56 of these cases have been of unaccompanied minors from Iran. So I'm talking about these 56 particular cases, their experiences um, of claiming asylum in the UK since year 2005, which is politically significant. Um, and this is where I take off from where Anne Singleton um, left off, that um, what happens um, in the world affects what happens here in, in uh, Europe with asylum seeking. So it's, they're not ex mutually exclusive. What happens matters. In 2005, the Iraqi Kurdistan um, became an autonomous, and uh, Iraq also um, had a Kurdish president. That gave a lot of hope to the Kurdish region in Iran, and there was a lot of um, support for what was happening in Iraq, which made Iranian Kurdistan a very um, militarized and security conscious region. And since then, the, there's been a flight of um, children from the region. So I'm very specifically talking about Kurdish children who have been through the asylum system in the UK and who have failed. Um, so that's where I'm uh, talking about. Um, the transit that they've gone through, I'm not going to comment on that. And then I'm going to talk about the asylum system. So I will very briefly talk about um, the conditions that these children come from um, in Iran. Um, the background of most of these children, their access to education has been limited. Um, Iran, um, legis according to legislation, um, recognizes their cultural and religious and language rights, yet these children are not allowed to study in their mother tongues and they have to learn Persian. For that reason, a lot of these families of these children didn't allow them to go to school, so they came to the UK illiterate. Um, some of them have been victims of landmines, or their families have been victims of landmines. Um, again, left over from the eight-year Iran-Iraq war. And their access to health and social welfare has been very limited, because again, Kurdistan is intentionally economically deprived, and a lot of 
uh, political unrest goes on there. These children um, have complained about threats to their um, liberty and life. They're mainly male. Culturally, again, girls are not sent from the region. It's male. Um, and I've dealt with cases from eight to 17 and a half, eight years old to 17 and a half. The eight-year-old is separated from his mother on route. So I, I won't talk about him, but just the, those who have failed. Um, they've been victims of discrimination because of their religious. They're Sunni Muslims. Iran is predominantly Shia. The political system is Shia. And again, as Sunni Muslims, they're discriminated against. And because of the system in Iran, they feel disillusioned and disenfranchised. There's no hope for their future. So they do get involved and they fall victim to the kind of political and ethnic groups that work within Iran. Um, they are targeted to become suicide bombers against the regime. So for that purpose, again, if a child is recognized to be from a political family, he becomes a target of the security forces. And if the father is killed or arrested or whatever, all attention goes on the child. So the family sometimes feel it's safer for the child to be out of harm's way. And they risk and send their children at great expense to European countries. Um, so I'm talking about those who come to England. So this is where they're coming from. They arrive in the UK um, to contain <coughs> asylum. They have no English, they hardly speak Persian, they have no knowledge of the asylum system. So they don't know that well, once they arrive in the United Kingdom, they're supposed to say, I claim asylum. And a lot of them who come um, and arrive at the port of Dover um, are returned either to France or to Belgium because either they look like adults, the, the immigration officer at the border makes a very um, random decision that they look like adults, so they're not referred to social services as they're supposed to. And because they haven't physically said, I want to claim asylum, they're not recognized as claiming asylum, and they're returned. Those who are recognized as children, or those who do say the word asylum, um, manage to go through the process. Um, but a lot of them actually come through and they pass the ports of entry in the UK and they land somewhere in the middle of the United Kingdom. And then um, somebody in the street picks them up and they are taken to a police station and then the whole system starts from there. Um, those are, these children are at great risk um, because if their age is disputed arbitrarily, um, they end up in detention until age assessment has been done properly and then they can be moved out of detention. That's quite traumatic what these children go through when they get, um, when they go through this wrongful age assessment. And all of the cases that I have worked with who have been in detention have since been released because they were recognized as minors once proper age assessment was made of them. Um, and we've had children in detention for as long as six weeks um, at certain times. Um, the younger ones, uh, the ones below 16, have been placed in foster care or they have some form of legal guardianship. Um, what happens if they are recognized as a, a, as a refugee, um, which is very rare, then they're granted status and they can stay in the UK um, in, indefinitely. But a lot of them um, are not granted refugee status. They're only allowed to stay in the UK until they reach 17 and a half, 18, and then they are deported or they are threatened with deportation. So a lot of cases that come to me are from lawyers who are dealing for these children who are about to hit 18 and are going to be deported from the UK back to the place that they have fled from. These children report a great deal of anxiety. They are very, uh, their future is very uncertain. They experience insecurity. They're very, they have a very unstable life because they don't know <coughs> that once they hit 18, what's going to happen to them. And they have great fear. Um, on the positive side, when these children, particularly the younger ones, the ones below 16, when they are placed with foster care or they have some kind of legal guardianship, they really flourish and they prosper. And although they are illiterate according to international standards, as soon as they are encouraged and they are supported to learn, their English language develops very well, they integrate really well into their community, they play in football groups and they do really well. Nevertheless, they have the anxiety and fear that very soon this is going to be finished and they're going to be um, passed over back to Iran. And that creates a huge amount of anxiety for them. And one of the main issues that has repeatedly come up is their lack of access to mental health support because they need a lot of support to be able to 
um, overcome the kind of anxiety and the mistrust that they have of the system and this constant fear that they're going to be returned. Um, one of the main problems that we have with these children is because they come from rural areas um, with limited access to telephones, so they become um, estranged from their families um, from Iran as well because they have no way of contacting their family members in Iran. Um, so it's a huge amount of problem and they, because of their age, particularly the younger ones, they integrate very well and this fear that as soon as they become 18 they're going to have to go to an unknown um, environment is very worrying for them. Um, I have some policy recommendations based on my own experience against the <coughs> children. A lot of them, um, they feel there are a great deal of obstacles for them to access appropriate services which would offer them effective protection. So it's really important for policymakers to look at this and to remove these kinds of obstacles, like the fact that these children don't know what claiming asylum means or what the process is, um, actually prohibits them from asking for help or getting the right kind of help, unless they have a carer who will look after their rights and is able to provide for them. Um, definitely we need to improve their access to mental health services because a lot of them will benefit from that. Um, a lot of these children who've come uh, through to me, um, it's haphazard. It's only because the lawyers that are caring for them or looking after them know me personally because of something I did in year 2000. I act as a catalyst and put them in touch with various other Kurdish groups and whatever, but I only see, or certain limited cases are referred to, and there are many others who don't necessarily have that kind of contact. And I think, again, it's really important to improve um, their contact with um, community and peer groups, particularly, again, in the United Kingdom. Um, one of the things that we experience, because these children are dispersed throughout the United Kingdom, but particularly in England I'm talking about, there is a great deal of disparity between local authorities in how they're dealing with these children. Some um, are dealt with and looked after very well, some aren't, depending on where they are. Again, some of them, according to where they've been placed, are victims of racism and bullying and all that sort of thing, some aren't. So it very much depends on the child, where they've been placed and who's looking after them. And this is arbitrary, and again, we need to be able to streamline that so all local authorities behave in the same way and offer the same kind of service and support and protection um, for these children. Um, there are strong contradictions between child welfare laws and immigration um, legislation in the UK. Again, we need to get rid of that and to bring um, immigration laws where it deals with children in line with child welfare laws and um, efforts to improve the very unpopular image that um, asylum seekers have. Um, they're like parasites, they're taking our money, they're taking our homes, they're taking our jobs. So there are a lot of negative aspects to asylum seekers. And so it's important to overcome that. So we need some concerted effort in um, media coverage of uh, reporting on them in a different way. Um, and the kind of key question that I have goes back to what we were discussing with Alice Hamilton. And we can't look at these children, not just Iranian asylum seekers, Iranian unaccompanied minors, all um, asylum seekers in general, but particularly minors. We can't look at them in isolation. We can't just say, okay, they have landed from Mars in the United Kingdom. We don't care about what's happened over there. It is not over there. It's our trade policies, it's our economic policies, it's this globalization of trade and economy um, that actually affects the lives of these children. They are persecuted where they live, and because of the policies that we have here, once they get here, they don't receive the right protection that they should be getting. And those who do manage to get the protection prosper really well. So the question that I want to throw to the floor is um, the shared responsibility. What is the shared responsibility for the 44 industrial countries that are host to all the asylum seekers internationally, but specifically the 27 EU states, who have very different asylum policies in dealing particularly with children? They are all signatory to um, various international conventions. All European countries are signatory to CRC, and, but they have national laws that means how they interpret the international obligations differ from country to country. 
And for example, we just heard that in um, Netherlands, they're kept in detention centers or in asylum hosting um, units, whereas in the UK, they're dispersed um, within families. So there are very different ways of dealing with these children. So, um, but my question um, is, what is the responsibility for these countries in actually supporting dictatorships, governments that actually <coughs> oppress their own citizens that gives rise to migration, to asylum <coughs> seeking, and to these children um, of families risking the lives of their minors, of their children, into an uncertain country where they have no idea of their culture and uh, what's going on, but they still feel it will be safer for the child to be in this unknown than remaining in a country where they could be persecuted, imprisoned, and then killed. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank Rovia, for the Rovia, for all the vision she, uh, she presented uh, regarding the problem of the Iranian uh, seekers, uh, asylum seekers in the UK, and also for the recommendations that she presented regarding uh, the, the ways to, to solve, uh, the policy recommendations to solve this.